everybody. Thank you so much to all of you for having me come and present, or I guess having me stay in my office and present. <laughs> um, I'm going to stand up because, I don't know, I feel like the energy is a little different, you know, and it's hard to like sit and watch somebody else sitting. And I always feel like a reporter, like back to you in the studio. So, it's always weird, you know. And, you know, standing is like the natural way for faculty, I think. <laughs> All right, so I wanted to talk to you today a little bit about this project that we have called the Better Book Approach. And actually, I'm a learning scientist. Like, that's what I do as my job. And we're always trying to think about, oh, how do we use what we know as cognitive scientists, as psychologists, to actually promote transferable understanding, right? Because to me, the saddest thing is to see my students struggle so hard to learn something and then not see it be useful at all if the context changes even slightly. And so I want to prevent that tragedy. And so our better book approach is really trying to reach this mountain. Okay, this is our goal. Um, this, is, this project is funded by um, the California Learning Lab, which is out of the governor's office. And it's an intersegmental project. So it, um, we interact between the UCs, the CSUs, and the community colleges. So all of this stuff is not done by me alone. It's a whole team of people. I realize for this talk, I don't have a good picture of any of them. <laughs> so they're there, but we have all these teams spread across these different segments. And really, it's the work of all these hardworking faculty and researchers together. But I want to emphasize two things. You know, you know, we have this graduation 2025 for like some people in the CSUs, they're familiar with that. Um, but you know, as a teacher, like as somebody who's like in the classroom, who's like on the ground, um, like, I don't know if I'm making a difference in 20, graduation initiative 20, you know, my day to day, I don't know if I'm making a difference in that. But in my day to day, I could try to make a difference in really doing a good job of teaching my students the hard things and making sure that those hard things reach all students, not just my top students, and not just, you know, just the students who are motivated already, but you know, trying to reach all students. Now, for me, I always see this blockage between research and practice from both ends of the spectrum as both a researcher and an instructor, a practitioner. So I do research. I literally look at things that are so tiny, like when you talk about standard deviation, should you use this hand gesture or this hand gesture? That is literally a paper that I have published. It's kind of ridiculous, the super, super specific things that I've researched, right? And you know what? There's a difference, a tiny, tiny difference, but there is a difference between explaining standard deviation like this and explaining it like this. Now, I write this paper, my students work very hard, I get it published, reviewer two hates me, there's all this stuff, right? It's hard, we get it published. Oh, and guess what, nobody reads it. Good job me, right? And then, I don't know, some people make videos on YouTube, and guess what, 90% of them, you can't even see their hands when you type in standard deviation, right? Ugh. And then people are using those as their course materials. And instructors realize, wow, these course materials suck. So they make it better. They find a workaround. And I never learn about it as a researcher or as a different instructor, right? And so even though we in the, in, you know, our, our ivory tower of academia realize that ideas are important, ideas are really only like, I don't know, 20%. Like the other 80% is like getting it to work in the real world, right? And it's like, how do you do that part? So we have a different vision for how to do research and practice better. And we call it the better book model. And our fundamental core idea is to focus all our energies, like Care Bear Stare, into one set of materials. These uh, and we think of it as like an online interactive textbook, right? So that's at the center and all the researchers put their research ideas in there. The designers and developers are busy developing this. Instructors are busy evaluating and figuring out, hey, what are the parts of this thing that don't work? What are the parts that we really need 
research on. And so we want to build these R&D communities around a continuous improvement of these online learning resources. And we've decided to learn how to do this by doing it. And we picked a class that's commonly taught all across this, uh, the uh, higher ed and even K-12 spaces, um, introduction to statistics. Everybody takes intro stats, right? Like this is a very basic class. And it's also very hard to learn. So we're like perfect for our teaching hard things to all students. So I, I feel like we could probably just spend all our time kind of right here. <laughs> if, you, if you want to, no worries, you know. So I'm gonna take a little pause for questions um, in a little bit. But if you want to test drive our version of the course, um, you wanna think about it as version 1.0. It's not better yet, it's mediocre, right? But the idea is that these set of materials get better over time, right? And so you could test drive it. This is on the free version of Camp Canvas because many of us are from different institutions. Um, we have 1,200 or more formative assessments already built in. Our pages interleave lots of components, including video, narrative, our exercises, questions. Students get feedback pretty automatically. Um, and so uh, let me show you, let me, kind of get out of here to kind of show you what this looks like. I think I saw a flash. Was there a question? No. So here, um, I'm just gonna show you what it looks like. Uh, there we go. So I wanna show you what it looks like. This is the teacher's point of view, but actually let me um, show you what it looks like from the student's point of view. Whenever I have Zoom running, everything's a little bit slower, so apologies. All right. I will just show you the teacher's point of view. You could, you could kind of imagine the student's point of view. All right, so one of the things that we do is um, modern statistics really requires knowledge of computers, right? I mean, it's kind of like, uh, hello, we're in 2019. We really need to do that. And so our statistics class is really a statistics and data science class. It's really doing statistics in a modern way. And that requires programming. And we envision, this is a, this is a set of textbook materials that is intended for students who have no experience and even hate math, science, programming, all that stuff, who feel very math anxious. That's our target audience. That's who we want to reach, right? And so one of the things we do is um, we have a lot of built-in components. So let me just show you an example of this. So a lot of times students are just reading along in, um, in the instructor version of the course, you could actually see a little bit of data, like how many students have viewed the page, how many students have completed the page, the average number of times viewed, you could download that data. Uh, this is actually a uh, instructors, so they have no FERPA rights, so we could show you all their data. <laughs> so these are just instructors who are like checking out our course. And so we have little code blocks right here. So it says for the for people who've never done programming, we just say things like, oh, read the code in the window below. What do you think it will do? Press the run button and see what happens, right? And so they press run and it says hello world on this side. And it says look at the console window. You can see that R displayed hello world. And then um, so all the code that they run is already built in. They don't have to go to some separate program or some separate uh, window or login to something else to do it. It's all right here. And then we also have other pages. Um, so these are, we have pages where there are student questions. Um, let me get a sample page. We have, you know, multiple choice, open-ended, um, lots of different kind of questions, as well as these coding blocks. And everything is interleaved. Let me just show you this. 
So here's another code block. I could see how many people got it correct on their first try. I could download all the responses from students. And that's been just really helpful for me to just know what to work on and what not to work on. Because then in class, I know, oh, we really need to go over this. Like, nobody got that right. And so here are some examples of, of open-ended questions. And I could quickly view what different people might have said. Oh, here's what people think. And I could also download all this data if I really wanted to grade it. Let me show you an example of like a, of like a multiple choice question. Um, in this case, 100% of students, or these are instructors, got the right answer. Um, and so I could actually look at these right away. A lot of times, it's almost like having a clicker question during homework, because I will look through these before class and be able to figure out, oh, students really had a hard time with this one. And I know the most popular wrong answer was this one, right? And so those are really helpful for me as an instructor to figure out, hey, this is an example of something that I know is a misconception. And I could directly target that misconception instead of just wondering, hmm, I wonder why they got that wrong, right? And so here's a case of that where this was the correct answer, all of the above, but most people chose just one of these. And then I could wonder to myself, oh, how come they didn't realize that these were also correct answers, right? And so I could address that in class. So that's kind of what it looks like. Um, we, we envision this as like a, a, a textbook. I mean, textbook is a really weird way of saying it because it's super interactive. There's all these different components, but we don't want instructors to think that this will do all the teaching for them. Um, almost all the instructors who currently use our textbook also meet with students face to face 100% of the time. You know, it's not hybrid or online course or anything. Although we could imagine somebody turning it into an online class. Um, we just think of this as like your online textbook. And so a lot of our students um, do this as homework. So instead of doing homework as in like, I don't know, problems from like a stats textbook, they read these, they do the questions, they try the coding blocks, and that counts as their homework. And you could also see what we call my progress. And so um, this is a really quick way for instructors to just download the data. And because we conceptualize ourselves as a textbook rather than a class, um, we don't pre-assign any of these things. So I don't know what an instructor is gonna do with this. Maybe they'll assign points for this. Maybe they'll grade the open response questions. Um, maybe they'll skip a chapter. Like, I don't know what they're gonna do. And so we have my progress, which is separate from grades. And instructors can do their own grades, but we think of this as, oh, this is like the textbook. Sorry, that's not my phone, so I can't stop it from ringing. <laughs> Okay, so we do have actually a question about oh. the um, about this being a statistic a statistics resource. And so the question is, how differently is intro to statistics taught in social sciences versus math versus economics? And would this courseware adapt to those different approaches approaches? So that's a really great question. We currently have people using this course in uh, the London. Uh, they're checking it out in an econ department. Um, we have it in a math department, a sociology department, a psychology department, um, as well as like, um, like some sort of university like bridge course, as well as a political science graduate course. And so there's a wide variety of courses that are currently implementing the, uh, these set of materials. They're written somewhat generically so there's different kinds of examples, um, like we have lakes and movies and psychology examples and econ examples. Um, the American Community Survey is in there. And so a lot of the examples are pretty, um, pretty wide ranging. But one of our hopes is that as we have a bigger community of instructors using the materials, that they'll start to develop things that we could put into the course and different like modules or examples could be turned on and off by different people using it. For example, a, a biologist that we're talking to right now has developed these simulations that are specific to biology. They're biological examples. And he was thinking, oh, if I wanted to uh, create a set of lab exercises, um, would that be okay? And we're like, that would be great. And then maybe a bio professor using this set of materials could turn on those resources while you know, the people who are not bio don't have to use those at all. 
And so that's the hope. Any other questions? Well, that was all we had all at this right. point. Thank you. All right. And so that's kind of what the Canvas experience looks and feels like from the student and the instructor perspective. And, um, you know, we as learning scientists built this interactive approach because we know from a lot of research in cognitive scientists, a cognitive scientists, sciences, um, that asking these questions actually stimulates a curiosity and it makes students more likely to be interested in the answer. And making predictions actually makes students more likely to learn and be interested and actually be kind of, um, kind of thrilled about their lack of knowledge, which is kind of a different experience than students' normal experience, where they feel like if they don't know, that that's a bad sign. But you know, if you think about curiosity, it's not knowing, but it feels good, you know? And we wanna give students that experience. Now we think of this better book model as having different phases of work. The first is kind of an innovation phase where we're cr creating just version 1.0 of course materials. We're doing it with all the learning science that we know, with everything that we know about statistics education and where that's going. We're doing our best, but the truth is no one's best is good enough. Anytime you do anything for the first time, it pretty much sucks. And that's the reality of it. The question is, how do you get better? Part of how we get better is by getting this implemented in a diversity of classrooms. That's why we're not just interested in having UCs uh, adopt this textbook. And we're not interested in just psychologists or whoever adopting this textbook. We're really interested in a variety of implementations in large lectures, in small lectures, with um, students in the math department, students in the sociology department, with uh, people on small campuses and large campuses, community colleges, all the way up through the UC. And so that's really the phase that we're in now. We're rolling it out to all these different campuses and really trying to understand what doesn't work for students. What doesn't work for instructors? And what are ideas we have for making this book better? So it's really different from saying, hey, look at our book, it's awesome, it's gonna work. We don't say that at all. In fact, we promise that it probably won't work, but we need your help to figure out how to make it work. And that's the process of improvement that we really think is missing in the education R&D space. And then the future that we're really trying to keep our eye on is in the future, we think about those adaptive interventions as coming out in the future. Once we have a sense of what do students struggle with, these kind of students who have this kind of preparation in math really struggle with this part. So maybe they could get this resource before that one, right? Like that's the dream, but in order to get there, we actually need this implementation phase to roll out first. Now, I told you we tried our best. We honestly did. <laughs> like, but um, what does our best mean, right? And so I want to tell you a little bit about the theory that went into why we designed it with these interactive approaches and kind of what was the thinking behind that. Now, I'm going to summarize all of cognitive science in like three slides. So I apologize for being kind of glib, <laughs> so, you know, due to time constraints. So. So what does research say about learning in these complex domains? And statistics is a complex domain. Well, you know, we want to think about this as how to promote transfer. And there's been a ton written about comparing classrooms and all kinds of different settings and then saying, oh, look, these classrooms happen to produce the best students in the world. What are they doing differently? Right? And we're always looking for what are they doing? What's the magic sauce? And I've got to say, studying all of these things, reading all the research, looking at all these books, it's not really about what the teachers do, but it's about the learning opportunities that they create, which should beg the question, what's a learning opportunity? Right? And so we think of learning opportunities as this, and we're really thinking that a learning opportunity kind of has three different um, dimensions. So two of these dimensions are an 
emphasis on explicit connections. You know, when you talk to experts, they really emphasize structure, abstract connections, but learners or novices often get tripped up by little details that they don't realize they're not important. They're not sure what's important and what's not. So it turns out that a learning opportunity has to have an emphasis on explicit connections. The second dimension is productive struggle. See, I used to be a workout instructor, and it's actually not good enough to watch me work out. It turns out that you have to work out to get a workout, right? And so it turns out that even when you're watching a lecture, students who are doing the active work of trying to understand, they're having a very different experience than students who are uh, not really struggling to understand it. So how do we make productive struggle around explicit connections, right? So we've thought about some of these um, examples of common teaching strategies and kind of tried to um, categorize it using this structure, right? So for example, you commonly see this in like K-12 math classes where they'll just do step-by-step -step procedures. And this is kind of low in connections and also low in struggle. It's not that hard to just Follow these simple steps. Okay, flip the second fraction and then multiply across and then reduce at the end, right? These are step by step, but it's not a focus on connections and it's not very, it doesn't promote struggle. Now, a well formed lecture, on the other hand, is slightly different because often a well formed lecture really has a good emphasis on the important connections that students should be thinking about. But often, for most students, they don't struggle that much when they're listening to a, a well-formed lecture. They could, but they often don't. On the other hand, discovery learning is all about promoting student struggle, really getting students to roll up their sleeves and struggle and try to figure things out, be wrong and be gritty, right? But there's no guarantee that they're going to be even thinking about the right things. They might not pick up on any of the right connections at all, right? And so we think the sweet spot of a learning opportunity is right here in this quadrant, right? Not only that, but we are interested in learning in complex domains, which means you can't learn it in 10 minutes. You can't learn it in an hour. You probably have to have repeated exposure in lots of different circumstances over time. Right? So how do you do that? Well, there's a whole literature and expertise called deliberate practice. This is with expert violinists and chess players and tennis players and referees and sommeliers. And they do what's called deliberate practice. What they try to do is they try to maintain a level of struggle over time. So if something gets too easy for them, they change their practice so that the struggle remains roughly similar over time. And it's a constant focus on the right features, the right connections over that time. So we call this the practicing connections framework. And what we think about it in, you know, what, when we say this to teachers, we really say it's just three words, practice making connections. Right? Because the connections are the explicit connections part. The making of them is the students actually making them. And the practice is saying, look, it's not enough to do it one time. You got to keep practicing that over time. And if it becomes easy, that means you need to change it a little bit to keep that struggle at that optimal level. So how do you do this? And we're saying, you know, Let's learn by example. Let's learn by actually seeing it happen in an introductory statistics class, right? And so um, I want to give you kind of the backdrop to the statistics world. I don't know how, if how many of you guys remember like any stats classes that you may have taken, but some of these things might look familiar, you know, but this is like often the problem of a stats class. There's all these tiny bits you have to like cover in the whole class. And it's like, oh, there's all this stuff to learn and cover. And the honest truth is, Students might learn all these pieces, but they don't know how it comes together. They don't know how they fit together. There's no explicit connections, right? And so it just feels like you're trying to keep like a hundred things in your head and inevitably you lose 20 of them, right? So they learn the pieces, but they don't see the connections. And because they don't have any 
understanding of the connections, they can't transfer to new contexts. I've literally given students the same problems, but just changed it into like a decimal instead of like a whole number. And it's like, whoosh, the knowledge is gone, right? But that shows that that knowledge was super fragile to begin with. Okay, so when you have to practice making connections, it begs the question, well, what are the connections? And then how do you practice making them, <laughs> right? And so I want you to think about this as ingredients to like a cooking demo. These is, the connections are the kind of mise en place. It's the like nicely cut up vegetables, right? And then I'm gonna show you how to put them together in the cooking demonstration a little later. So get ready to learn some statistics. Ha -ha. So this is kind of an overview of our whole class. Um, so for us, we're really keeping our eye on coherent, connected understanding. And in order to get that, the connections have to be powerful, as in generalizable, but they have to be understandable by a novice. They can't be so abstract that a novice can't possibly understand them. So we think there are three connections in statistics that we should really think about. One is, what is the world? What is the world of statistics? What is the world of examples that we want students to be able to transfer to? What are the core concepts that organize the domain of introductory statistics? And then what are the representations that embody those concepts? Because concepts, they're just ideas. We have to communicate them somehow with representation. So the first thing we thought about is, well, what do real data analysts do? What do data scientists actually do? They don't look up tables in the back of the book. They don't compute standard deviation by hand. This is what they actually do. They get some data and they explore variation. They're interested in why are some people scoring high and why are some people scoring low? Why are these buses always late? And why are these buses on time, right? They're interested in questions like that. They're exploring variation in something. And then they create models of that variation. And then, they evaluate those models and they think to themselves, is this model any good, right? And so we really want students to practice doing that. Um, we think about it as a, like a routine, practice doing this routine of thinking. Now, in terms of core concepts, we actually think there are three core concepts because there's always three, come on, right? Um, so the first concept is what we call the distribution triad. There are three different kinds of distributions, three different kinds of ways you could think about variation being represented in data. And we think of this as the sample data, the population or data generating process and the sampling distribution. The second core concept is a statistical model. Whenever you talk to um, data scientists, they always say, oh, all of statistics, is data equals model plus error. But what does that mean? My students don't know what that means, right? And so our job is to really make that into a useful concept for students. And then finally, the core concept of randomness. Randomness is actually a really hard thing for just humans in general to understand, but it's a really powerful concept in statistics and probability. So we really want students to think about randomness as a data generating process. It's a way that we could generate data and see what happens. This is why data scientists are always saying, oh, what if we just sampled from blah, 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 and they talk like that, right? It's because they're just thinking about, oh, what would happen if we did this randomly many, many times over time? And, you know, a lot of these kinds of ideas. They're not from us. They're from the statistics education literature that has really been trying to push introductory statistics into a form that's useful for big companies that deal with big data, such as Google, Facebook, Uber, right? These are the things that those data scientists are telling us universities need to cover. So what are the ways that we represent these big ideas? Well, we actually think you should only have a few representations and that these representations should be highly connectable because the focus is on making connections, right? And so we don't want too many connections. We want just a few. And so these are some of the connections, these are some of the representations that we picked for the specific reason 
that they are highly alignable. We always use a certain kind of pattern that repeats over the whole class. And so we want to get students to start to see that underlying structure repeating in lots of different representations. All right. And a lot of people freak out because they're like, well, our intro stat students can't learn code. That's computer science. That's programming. And many people even told us, you should not try to teach students R. R is a terrible programming language. And so, you know, we kind of accept that. But the reason why we chose to use coding is that many of our students are actually quite terrible at algebra. Scientific notation and mathematical notation means very little to them. And it's actually intimidating for them to look at notation. Like they freak out just because they see a sigma, right? I don't even ask them to do anything, but they're just scared, right? Now, how do you reach those students and teach them hard things? One of the nice things about code is that code often, in some ways, sounds like language. And so one of the things we've been looking into is how to use code to teach kind of algebraic concepts. And one of the things students start to do is appreciate how code gives you feedback. It's a representation that you could actually check to see if it did what you wanted it to do. And really, we don't think of our class as trying to create programmers. We're using code as a representation of concepts. And that's one of the things that students start to appreciate in our class. They even start to tell us, you know, it's funny. The code is the easy part. It's understanding that's the hard part. And we're like, exactly. That's exactly right. OK. So that's the mise en place. That, those are all our ingredients. How do you put them together to actually practice making connections, right? So this is the cooking demo, right? All right, so I'm gonna take you through an example that we have in the book, and it starts in chapter four. And we actually, and we actually go through the, this one example, uh, and many examples like this, uh, but we, kind of follow one example in these kind of threads through the whole course so that students could see these ideas being built up over time. So here's a real example of a study. They were interested in whether drawing a little smiley face on like receipts, on checks, would make tables tip more, right? And so they wanted to do a little experiment. And so they wrote, uh, they drew smiley faces on half the checks and they didn't draw smiley faces on the other half of the checks. And then they just looked at, well, how much did people tip, right? And so in a traditional bits approach, they would probably teach you this as a t-test. They would say, here is the t-statistic, here is standard error, here's how you check whether it is statistically significant or not, and make sure to say statistically significant or not statistically significant, and nobody understands any of these words. We go through that example very differently in our book. So first, we wanna ground people in what data scientists actually do, right? And so we wanna ground people in exploring variation. One of the things we want people to appreciate is, hey, guess what? Not everybody tips the same amount. Some people tip a lot, some people tip very little. Why might people do that? Right? And we want them to see there are different ways you could represent that variation. And so we spend a lot of time in this textbook actually doing what we think of as publication ready visualizations. We actually use a R package that's used by 538, the New York Times. Like publications use these R packages to make their visualizations. Our students are learning those same visualizations. And one of the things we're trying to get students to do is not just tell them, hey, make this visualization, make a box plot. We don't tell students that. Instead, we practice making connections. We ask students questions like this. Hey, you see this table right here? They were in the control group and they tipped $39. Where is that in this histogram, for example? Where do you see that table? And what we want students to do is make a connection between different representations. 
And we also want them to make uh, connections between different visualizations as well as back to the data table. So in all of these ways, students are really trying to understand what are these things meaning? Because even though you, we tell students, hey, tip is on the X axis in the histograms, tip is on the Y axis in the you know, dot plot, students don't really understand what that means until we ask them to practice making the connections. And then we want them to start to think about what we call word equations and represent this idea that, hey, I don't know, it, it looks a little like tip, uh, this um, smiley face might make a difference, but I don't know, it seems like they're pretty similar too. Like there are some people in the control condition that are tipping a lot, and there are some people in the smiley face condition that are tipping very little. What's going on? And so we want them to represent ideas or hypotheses like, um, hey, maybe knowing a little bit about what condition they're in might help us make a slightly better prediction about their tips into these word equations. Tips equals condition uh, plus some other stuff because condition doesn't explain all of the variation. It might explain a little bit of it, right? And then it also, we, we worked really hard to use a set of our uh, code that's been written by um, statistics educators. And so the code mimics those word equations. So the code looks like this, box plot, tip, tilde, condition. So they always see this tip equals condition, tip, tilde, condition, and it prepares them for that kind of structure. And we always get them to go back to core concepts. We say, hey, this is just this sample of, I don't know, 40 tables at a restaurant. I don't know, will this work at some other restaurant in some other city with some other wait staff? I don't know. What's the data generating process like, right? We want them to go beyond the sample data that they have. And so we want them to wonder, hmm, I wonder if something about people, like, I don't know, they see a smiley face and, and somehow they start tipping differently. The data generating process, what's that like? and to represent their ideas of the data generating process in word equations, but also to consider, could randomness have generated this pattern of data? Like if I just took two groups of tables and I didn't do anything differently to their receipts, could I have gotten two slightly different groups of tables and one group happened to tip a little more than the other? Sure, why not, right? Couldn't it have just been random? And then we want them to instantiate randomness as a data generating process. So one of the examples of a data generating process we have students do is they take these data points and they just shuffle it into two groups. It's not the groups that were actually part of the study, but just to see if they could just by shuffling it into two groups, get two groups where one is better, slightly better than the other, right? And so we get students to do that. And we get students to just look at many examples of this shuffling data generating process. And so they could see, oh yeah, sometimes they look kind of even. Sometimes it looks like the control group ends up being a little bit better. Sometimes it looks like the smiley face group looks a little better. And we want them to wonder, hmm, is this one like all of these? Is it easy to create this pattern of data using a random process such as shuffle? Or is that kind of a hard pattern to generate with this data generating process? And we do all of that before we even calculate a mean. A story just came out on NPR about how we spend so much time doing so much stuff before we calculate anything in our class, right? And it's because we're preparing the way for them to understand how to model variation. Because now we've come to the end of all we could do just exploring variation. Now we actually wanna model it. And so we actually shift to formal models where before we just eyeballed it, but now we're actually creating formal models. And over time, we teach them the general linear model. But our students are prepared for that. 
because they've been writing code that looks like that for a long time now, <laughs> for four chapters. And so they're now like, oh yeah, this kind of feels familiar. There is notation that they have to learn, but when they're learning that, they're learning it in a very different way. They're not learning to calculate it, they're writing code for it and then learning to interpret that code and also learning how to represent that model in mathematical notation as well as in the visualization. They're practicing making connections, right? And so here, the best fitting model for this example is actually the mean of one group and then a little bit of what you would add if you wanted to predict the mean of the other group. And so that's really the, uh, the way we teach two group models. Now, I want to kind of show you how we get students to do that here. You know, we have students look at these general linear models, we, and we don't ask them calculate the 27. Instead, we ask questions like this, where is the 27 on this visualization? And students have to see, oh, that's the mean of the control group. That's where the 27 is. Now, the harder question is, where's the six, right? And immediately, students want to say it's the mean of this group, but then they look at it and they say, oh, wow, that can't be six because it's more than 27. Oh, what does that mean? And by struggling to make the connection, they realize, oh, that is the little increment that you add on if you are in the smiley, if that table is in the smiley face group. And so they learn to interpret these coefficients in a way that's very self-driven. They make the connections. And we do this on Canvas and they drag things in and, um, and they answer these questions and we are able to give them feedback. We also do it in class, by the way. Doing it once on Canvas is definitely not enough. <laughs> And then once they do that, now they're able to revisit those, those shuffled uh, visualizations that they created. And now they could fit this difference between the two groups into all of these randomly generated visualizations. And students start to see, huh, sometimes we get zero, sometimes we get negative two or negative one, sometimes we get five, right? They seem to kind of hover around zero. And then they're able to ask themselves, oh, huh, could we get six from doing a random data generating process like shuffle? Wow, we don't get six very often, but how likely is it? And that's when we shift to evaluating models. That's kind of the end of the road they get to when they are able to create models. But now, how do you evaluate them? And from here, what we do is we get students to imagine taking all these uh, parameter estimates and then putting them into its own distribution. And so we're building up from all the things that they've done so far, but all they're doing is they're thinking about doing this thousands of times instead of just like six or seven times, right? And then putting the result of those thousands of times into a histogram and representing that as a distribution. And, and then we could kind of see our distribution triad building up. Now we could take our sample mean difference of six and say, how often do we get a mean difference of six between the groups by just randomly creating two groups? And this is the beginning of their understanding of p-value which is a very, very hard concept for almost everybody, including statisticians. So that's kind of an overview of the whole class. Um, but notice it's a, quite a bit more involved and more complex than just teaching a t-test. So what do you get for all, all this effort? Well, we get a lot of practical and psychosocial benefits. Like for instance, students who come into our class dreading R start to say to themselves, oh, I, I was really surprised at how much I actually liked it. And I even feel motivated to take another programming class. I would have never chosen to take a programming class because I didn't really think about that as something that was open to me. But now that I did it, it just doesn't seem as hard as I thought it would be. And that really warms my little heart. But also, 
we're aiming at transferable knowledge. I want to be able to ask my students very hard questions from circumstances they've never imagined and get them to transfer their knowledge. And that's the holy grail for me. And we're able to get that. One of the things we see in our class is we see near instant transfer to more complex situations. Because we built in all this work to teach them the general linear model, one of the things we see is that they shift from group models and they're, they're able to repeatedly represent, coordinate, adapt these core concepts well in a certain situation. And then when we teach them regression, they feel like, oh, it's, it's not that different. It's a little different, but not that different. And students themselves notice the similarity, which is amazing to me because almost no students appreciate the similarity between a t-test and regression. And it turns out, even when we ask them to do this without reading the book first, students were able to adapt their interpretation of B sub one to a very different new context, almost inventing regression. They weren't completely right, but they were definitely on the right track. The kind of thinking where I could definitely build up from it as an instructor. And then this is a UCLA class actually that we just tested. Um, on their final exam, we gave them a few, exam uh, a few questions where we said, These, this part doesn't count. We just wanna know what you think. And we asked them to interpret the results of multiple regressions, something we don't cover in the introductory class. And students were able to adapt their understanding to a fair degree to kind of comprehend what multiple regression might be doing. And a lot of the stuff they were doing were spot on. They were able to predict what the general linear model would look like. They were able to predict what would happen to error. They were kind of like thinking to themselves, oh, what would this B sub one mean in this context? And they were definitely on the right track. And we're currently um, writing a paper about that because that's really exciting to us. Imagine, what if we didn't have to teach them everything? What if they could kind of learn new things on their own after our class? Amazing. Um, and one of the things that we continue to think about is even though we have some results, we're always reminding ourselves how mediocre we are, <laughs> you know? And one of the things we are thinking about is many of our students still continue to think that they need to memorize a lot about math. And it turned out that that was a really maladaptive practice because students who did not focus on memorizing actually did better on the final examination than students who focused more on memorizing. One of the things, uh, one of the real reasons why we think groups like this Canvas SIG is so important is that, you know, what we find is that for students who work, there's a stronger correlation between their online engagement and our textbook resources and their final grade. For students who do not work, we don't see any correlation at all, which is really interesting until you see their course attendance. We happen to have poll everywhere for some of these courses. And one of the things we see is that for students who work, they're just less likely to come to class. And so because of that, the online materials may matter more to them. Interestingly, there's not a big difference between the students that work and the students who don't work in terms of their final grade. But it might be because the online resources are supporting the students who, for whatever reason, couldn't make it to class. But you know what keeps us up at night? There are a lot of people, a lot, who are not ready to learn hard things yet. And a lot of people who are being written off in terms of their capacity to learn hard things. This number shocked me, so I want to share this with you. Apparently, 32% of 11th graders are conditionally ready or ready for college level math. And you know, Cal States and community colleges have gotten rid of remediation, right? And I think that's a really scary world to live in, right? We feel as educators like, ah, right? And we really wanna get in there and make a difference in that. And so we continue to press on teaching all students hard things. So that's it for me. I don't know if there's questions. Oh, I'm so sorry. I used so much time. No, thank you so much for sharing. Are there any specific questions that we want to pose to G while we have her <laughs> in, in real time? And I can stop sharing.
I could see your faces. So if, um, and then also, well, people might be thinking of questions. So is it helpful for, help you with your work to get the word out to get more people using your text or using your resource? Yeah, I, I mean, for us, we think of it as the more instructors that use our resources, the quickly we could get better. <laughs> but it also takes a kind of special kind of instructor to join with us in this because it is kind of risky. Um, we're not just doing traditional things, business as usual. Um, so what we have is a lot of early adopters, people who feel willing to take a risk and do something a little different and maybe see something a little more miraculous, you know? And then Alex, did you have a question? Alexander, did you have a question? No? Okay. I just got a comment from Andrea. Uh, says, I saw an example like yours in action in an engineering book, and the student never made the jump to figure out what the six was in that example. It just ended up in frustration and wasted hours. Yes. So the follow-up question is, how do you address the risk of the student not making the jump? Oh, I think about this all the time because the whole premise of practice making connections is that the students have to make the connection, right? They have to do that, right? And so how do you support them? And that's one of the things we're trying to understand in our better book approach. There were times in our textbook where we saw a lot of students not making the jump, right? And we're really thinking about, well, what are different things we could do to help them make that jump? What are different examples we could use to help them make that jump? And one of the things we literally did was we had a problem where almost 100% of students were getting this problem wrong across UCs, CSUs, and community college. You know there's a problem with that, right? And so we read the parts that came before and we realized, well, this textbook is horribly written by me. <laughs> and so we rewrote that part and it boosted students. Now like 60% of students are getting that question correctly. That's way better than 4%. But we realized we still have 40% more to go, right? And so we're still really interested in doing that. And what we want to do is gather together instructors, um, researchers, and developers and designers to help us figure out solutions for how to help all students make these jumps. Oh yeah, I was just reading this comment. Yeah, that R is integrated into Canvas. As somebody who has spent like a lot of days in the computer lab trying to get R Studio to work in the way that I want it to work and having students just being like, I can't download this whatever, whatever. It's so nice to have code that just works if you just get the code to work. They could kind of focus on that and it really takes a little edge off. <laughs> All right, anybody else have any other questions for G? No. All right, well, it looks like that's it. Well, G, I wanna thank you um, on behalf of the entire SIG group. Um, also just personally, cause I hadn't seen your spiel at all. So my head's like, pulsating with statistics stuff, which is not something I ever really think about. So thank you. <laughs> uh, You're welcome. <laughs> I uh, always hope students have that uh, reaction. <laughs> I mean, with what you just showed, I don't see how they couldn't, but. <laughs> um, so yeah, we will do our standard um, kind of follow up after this. This whole thing was recorded. So we'll send the recording out um, in a follow up email as well as post everything um, up on the SIG community.